Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Hip and Knee Arthritis webinar series with Dr. Nathan Hale. I'm Terry Armstrong. I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Texas Orthopedic Specialists. Uh, today, Dr. Hale will be discussing total hip arthroplasty. He'll specifically be talking about the direct anterior hip approach. Um, there's a little bit about our practice on your screen. Uh, we are Texas orthopedic specialists. We're comprised of fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons and subspecialized doctors. We have eight specialists at our practice, including Dr. Hale. Um, there's our office locations. We have one in Bedford. We have one office in Keller, and we have another office in Denton. And there's all our contact information should any of you guys need it. Um, if you missed any of Dr. Hale's previous webinar videos, they are all available on YouTube. If you go into YouTube, you just search Texas Orthopedic Specialist in the search um, bar, and our channel should pull up. And if you click on our channel, all of the videos published by our practice are on there, and all of these webinars are labeled webinar one, two, three, four, so you'll be able to find them and watch them. And they're also on our Facebook page. If you search at Texas Orthopedic Specialist, you can find us on there. And just a reminder to everyone, during Dr. Hale's talk, please use the questions section on your screen um, to ask any questions you have about today's topic or any of the topics we've discussed throughout the series or Dr. Hale has discussed. And we'll try to get all of them answered once he finishes up his talk. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to your speaker, Dr. Hale. Let's see, give me one second. There we go. All right. Thank you, Terry. Just wanted to say uh, thank you again and welcome again to our uh, hip and knee arthroplasty webinar. Today we're going to talk about uh, total hip replacement, specifically from the anterior approach and the, the um, ins and outs of all that. I also want to put a, a quick plug on for our YouTube channel that does have all these uh, webinars uh, archived and then also there's a there's a video of a live surgery on on that uh, YouTube channel that gives you a little bit bigger of an idea uh, as to how surgery goes in the OR. And we've also got a um, testimonial video from a patient that uh, recently had both of her hips done. So be sure and check those out if you have more questions. And then uh, without further ado, we'll get started. So today is about total hip arthroplasty. Uh, this is part five of six. Let me see if I can make my screen advance. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that we've been through today. Um, knee arthritis, uh, knee replacement, revision knee. Last week we did hip arthritis, uh, and that leads right into today, which is uh, direct anterior hip. So how do we get from here, which like we reviewed last week, on this side, we've got good joint space here to here, uh, only mild arthritis, really asymptomatic in this patient, as opposed to the right hip, which has bone on bone arthritis, large osteophytes, and cystic change in both the acetabulum and the femur. And so how do we get from here to here? And this, this is, uh, we'll learn that today. So what is arthroplasty? Um, again, the most common uh, arthroplasty surgery in the U.S. is total knee. Um, second would be total hip, which is what we'll discuss today. Uh, 2018 estimates estimates about 600,000 total hips by 2030. And this is a picture of uh, total hip replacement. This is specifically the one that I use. Um, you'll notice this is a this here is the stem part that goes down the femur. This is the ingrowth surface. This is the uh, femoral head, the liner, and then this is the acetabular shell that goes into the socket. So what is hip arthroplasty? So this is a cartoon image that shows this is the this is the pelvis over here on the right side or the patient's right. You notice uh, pristine, smooth articular cartilage or joint cartilage. This is the femoral neck, greater trochanter, and then lesser trochanter, as opposed to this side, which shows bone spurs on the front and cracked and broken cartilage here. So the um, 
femoral neck is cut here. This bone is discarded. Reamers are used to place this socket, and uh, then the stem is placed down the bone in the fashion that you can see here on the left of your screen. So who's a candidate? First of all, I look at age. Uh, ideally, the patient is going to be over 50, but there's many patients that will benefit from surgery uh, prior to age 50. And those are typically patients with uh, disease processes like we talked about last week, such as uh, avascular necrosis, whether that's from uh, treatment for HIV, cancer, high dose steroids. Um, and there's also uh, patients that have a, a past history of alcohol or drug abuse that have also um, gone on to AVN. Uh, trauma and infection are also causes of vascular necrosis. Patients that have dysplasia, like we discussed last week, can benefit from uh, reconstructive surgery or uh, of moving the bone. But if, if we miss that window, which is usually from the teens to mid 20s, then, then we're looking at doing total hip replacement in patients much younger. But for standard run of the mill, bone on bone, wear and tear arthritis, we really like to get these patients into their 50s. And the reason for that is because the, the plastic part uh, will actually doesn't last forever. And we want to try to limit uh, the number of surgeries uh, in these patients. However, when you do have a patient, like for instance, the one I showed previously in this slide, in this presentation, that patient was 40 years old. And uh, so to make him wait 10 years on that hip is, is not a good use of, of our, um, of what we can offer. And it's going to cause him to have about 10 years of pain without much benefit. So I, 50 is kind of the age I shoot for, but I'm not real strict on that. So we do look at x-rays. Is there bone on bone? Uh, if there's not bone on bone arthritis, does the patient have, a, have AVN? Do they have dysplasia? Do we need to get an MRI? And, and a lot of times we do utilize MRI in avascular necrosis or dysplasia. Um, and then what are the symptoms? So I, I see many, many patients that have uh, what they call hip pain, but it's it's mostly posterior in nature, or it goes down the back of their leg, or it's really more in their lower back. The thing that we're looking for the most is anterior groin pain that's worse with standing, relieved with sitting, and gets better with treatments like anti-inflammatories, injections, uh, using a cane or a walker, physical therapy, things like that. So it, when, when the anterior groin pain or the kind of the pain in the front of the hip, when that is severe, when it bothers you on a day-to-day -day basis, when it's limiting your activities and you've tried everything else and it doesn't work, that's the, the home run candidate. So now a lot of times patients will have, they'll have pain in, the, in their groin, but they'll also have pain on the lateral side or the outside of their hip. They'll have posterior pain, even low back pain. And a lot of these patients will get better with a total hip replacement. And so uh, I won't say that you won't get better, but it's, it's just not quite as reliable as that anterior groin pain. Um, and then we also look in to see uh, what kind of uh, previous treatments um, have, have been um, done today, so, or to date. And so, um, if age and, uh, and imaging are appropriate and conservative treatment has failed, then uh, we're looking at, I use these three questions, and these are, the, these are the same three questions I ask patients that need a total knee replacement. So do you have daily severe pain? Does your pain limit you on your daily activities? And do you make major decisions based on your knee pain? And, or this should say hip. So do you make major decisions based on your hip pain? Uh, and that can be different for each patient. So some patients just want to be able to walk down the aisle in the grocery store, and some patients want to be able to go skiing or other uh, high impact or uh, high intensity activities. And, and so, you know, we have a discussion in the office and we figure out what your goals are and whether hip replacements are reasonable treatment to help you accomplish those goals. And if, if they are, then we then this is a really, really good surgery that can be very advantageous for a lot of patients. So specifically talking about the anterior approach, this is the anatomy of the anterior hip, or the, more specifically the superficial anatomy of the anterior hip. 
Um, this muscle here is the called the tensor fascia lata, and this muscle here going away is called the sartorius. And so our interval is going to be right along those two muscles uh, between the TFL and the sartorius. Uh, other pertinent anatomy is the anterior superior iliac spine, which is part of your pelvis, and we stay on this side of that. These are the dangerous structures that you want, or the vital structures you want to stay away from. This is the femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein. And so we stay, we keep our incision way out here so that we're not uh, putting these structures at risk. This is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is a nerve that goes just to the skin on the outside of the knee, or on the outside of the thigh. And this, this nerve will come into play uh, later in the, in the talk, and we'll talk about that. But our, our interval is right between these two muscles. This is a cross-sectional picture. This is the tensor fascia lata here, this muscle, which is the same as this muscle here. And then this is the sartorius, which is the same muscle here. And then deep to that, we go in between the, the vastus lateralis and the rectus femoris here. So those, that's the, the, the uh, distal anatomy. And then this here, this structure is the, the hip capsule. So basically you go between the two muscles up here and you're right down onto the hip capsule. Uh, the benefit of this of this aspect of the surgery and this this approach specifically is that we don't actually have to cut any muscle. So we go right in between these two, and the muscles stay intact uh, in uh, probably 90% of surgeries. These are various approaches to the hip uh, to orient you again. This is the tensor fascia lata, which is that muscle on the outside of the hip. This is the sartorius. This is the, the big quadricep muscle. And so we're going to go uh, right in between the sartorius here and the tensor fascia lata along this green arrow, which, as you can see, goes right down to the hip. These are some other approaches. This, this one in the back of the hip is called the posterior approach, and you can see that goes right through this muscle. Uh, the posterior approach is an excellent approach, and uh, it's one that I utilize. It's just not my most utilized approach. And then this is a lateral approach, which I don't use. So uh, just as a, a very oversimplified uh, picture about doing a total hip arthroplasty, this is uh, the step after the previous step I showed where the femoral head has been cut and removed. We use these circular reamers that uh, scrape away the cartilage and the hard bone up in the acetabulum. Um, and then we impact a titanium socket into the bone and uh, this uh, grit blasted surface allows the bone on the acetabulum to grow into the socket. And so that, that fits uh, nicely in place. Following the, that aspect, we use these uh, devices called brooches to make a uh, pathway in the actual femur. And we use different sizes to until we get apposition between the cortical bone here and the cortical bone here. And then by putting those in place or using this type of brooch, it allows the bone to grow into the final implant, which looks like this. And then this is this is the actual implant that I use, and so this the brooches are shaped exactly like this prosthesis. It sits down into the bone and wedges from this side into this side against the bone, and then this surface allows for bone to grow in to the uh, femoral side. The acetabulum has the same grit blasted surface, and it allows bone to grow into here. Uh, after those two parts are in place, we place this plastic liner and then this ceramic head, and those fit together nicely, and, uh, and then that, that, that all that fits together to hold the hip in place. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we like to put off surgery until patients are over 50, because this liner here is made out of plastic, and although it's the gold standard for, uh, for liners in the United States right now, uh, it, it doesn't last forever. We, we think that those liners last about 15 to 20 years, 
uh, but uh, they were reworked about 15 years ago. So in my career, we'll find out if, if just exactly how long they last. But at this point, I feel confident uh, estimating a 15 to 20 year lifespan on a total hip replacement, as long as there's no other uh, complication. So tools I specifically use in, uh, in my surgery are, uh, are a couple. This is a this is called a Hanna or a Hanna table, and the patient uh, sits or lays on the table, uh, and they have their feet in these <clears throat> in these traction boots, which looks look a lot like ski boots. And what this allows me to do is manipulate these spars on the table, and I can move the patient's leg uh, around during surgery, and then it it holds the leg in place so I don't have to use another assistant to actually hold the leg in place. And so this, this is the setup for a normal uh, anterior total hip replacement that I'll use. It'll, the table allows us to uh, rotate the, the hip, it allows us to flex and extend the hip, and it's, it's a really, really nice way to be able to access um, each, each part of the hip that we need to get to, and it also allows us to perform these surgeries on patients of uh, any and all uh, body types. It, what you'll also notice is right here where the hip or where the pelvis is, there's, there's no metal underneath. These are made out of carbon fiber, and so by having no metal under here, it allows us to easily utilize the x-ray machine. And this is an intraoperative or several intraoperative uh, x-ray shots of, of the grid device that I use. And so this grid device is overlaid onto the x-ray. We line this line up to standardize the pelvis and we actually compare this x-ray to our standing x-ray from clinic. And so we can get a really good idea of exactly how the patient holds their pelvis and how, how each individual patient walks, which enables us to customize the placement of the implants for each patient. It also allows us to estimate the leg length. And so the way we do that is we standardize this line here, and then we look at this dark black line, and we can make sure that this, this part of the hip lines up with this part of the hip on the other side, and it enables us to dial in the leg length exactly how we would like to. Uh, it also allows us to, to judge uh, the distance of the hip from the pelvis, which we call offset. And so that's, this is a, a really nice device that enables us to do several measurements in surgery so that we're not, um, so that we don't have to estimate number one. And so we have actual feedback in the operating room to know that we put the components in in exactly the right place we wanted to. Now, if you'll look down here at the bottom of the screen, these images are relatively small, but you'll see these lines here, and the lines are at different um, different angles, but we can line up the acetabulum or the acetabular component, this socket, with these lines, and it enables us to put the to put the cup in in exactly the right position that we want to put it in, and have confirmation of that on the uh, in the operating room, and that way we can change anything if we need to. So this is a, I, I think this device is very valuable to my practice. It, I've, I've been able to be very, very happy with the placement of my components and then also just having the, the satisfaction and the, the comfort of knowing that we really did put the, the pieces in and exactly where we wanted to uh, before we get out of the operating room. So day of surgery, uh, you'll arrive at the hospital, you'll get settled in the pre-op area. Meet the RN, you'll get your IV, uh, you'll meet with the anesthesiologist and myself, and then we have the operation. After the operation, uh, you go up to the hospital room and you work with physical therapy. Now, most of the time, that's simply walking with a walker, um, doing stairs, making sure that you're going to be safe to go home, because most of my patients are going to go home either the day of surgery or on post-operative day number one. I do occasionally I'll have patients that need to, an extra day, but most of the time that's elderly patients that are just a little bit weak from surgery or may have had some low blood pressure or uh, another medical problem. So um, I do the anterior approach because it's the 
approach that I have the most comfort with. It's the approach I had the most experience with. And, and I feel like I'm able to do the best job for my patients. Um, you know, with me being the surgeon and in my hands, the anterior approach is, is the most reproducible. I get to use x-ray. I think it's the best. Um, I, I think it's better because you don't cut any muscles. Uh, you're going in between them instead of through them. It, there's evidence showing that it decreases the risk of dislocation. You know, we're taught as surgeons to, to first do no harm, just like all other doctors are. And we want to, so anything I can do to decrease the risk of, of a complication, uh, I will, I'll jump on that. And so by, by doing the anterior approach, uh, uh, I, I really don't have to think much about dislocation as a complication. It can still happen, but it's very rare. I love the ability, as I talked about, with the grid device to use x-rays, and then I can ensure that the correct size, the position, and the leg length are all right. Uh, it gives my patients a lot of confidence. It gives me a lot of confidence, and it helps me to know that if there is something wrong, I can see it immediately and change it while I'm in surgery. Now, as far as recovery, uh, the literature shows that anterior approach typically does have a quicker recovery in the first few weeks. Uh, by three months, that that there is no difference when you compare anterior approach to posterior or lateral approach, but uh, there is there is some um, recovery, in, there's some quick quicker recovery in the first couple of weeks. And that's generally uh, recognized across uh, most studies. Um, uh, this is a, a slide that I used in the total knee um, presentation, and I think it applies to total hip as well. These are all the advantages to doing uh, surgery in 2020. There's we do a good job of optimizing you with your with your primary doctor. You don't have to be uh, without food for so long. We're doing we're only waiting six hours from solids and two hours from liquids. We use uh, really modern anesthesia techniques. I, I typically use a spinal for all of my surgery. Uh, that that enables uh, much improved pain control, and then also it makes the operation um, easier to easier to accomplish because of the relaxation that's afforded by the spinal anesthesia. Uh, local anesthetic is uh, really decreases on, on uh, incision site pain. We have decreased blood loss. Um, we're really able to limit our narcotics. We don't do drains or catheters and we're moving you and getting you out of the hospital as soon as possible. So I think I think total hip replacement is one of the best surgeries that's ever invented by man, if not the best. I think it gets people back to, it vastly increases their quality of life. Uh, if I think patients that have um, end stage hip degenerative disease, whether that's AVN, osteoarthritis, dysplasia, what have you, in any type of hip pain, if we can find a, a good indication to do this surgery, it will, it will greatly increase your range of motion, your pain, and it allows people to get back to the quality of life that they want. So um, I really, really love doing this and I think it helps people so much. So um, with that, I'll, I'll end. And uh, if there's any questions, I can take those now, but uh, thank you for tuning in today. Okay, so while we wait to see if anybody has any questions, I have um, a question, Dr. Hale. Is there um, anything you could recommend or um, tell everybody about how they can reduce, like after they have a total hip replacement, how they can reduce the likelihood of injury or complication? Uh, yeah, so the basic, the, the quick answer is, is uh, follow your doctor's instructions. So, and most of the time that's gonna be use a walker for the first couple of weeks and and try to try to go you know progress slowly you don't want to try to be a hero so if you use a walker until you're able to walk without a limp um, and then really the don't do any high impact activity in the first couple of weeks or months after surgery but most people aren't really interested in doing that anyway so there to be honest with you when you when I do an anterior approach on these patients, I'm able to say, you can go back to the activities that you wanna do. There's, I don't put a lot of limitations on people. I tell you, you can't run for three months, but most patients don't wanna run anyway. So it's uh, it's not to say that there are not complications and, and there can always be accidents that happen, but 
uh, overall, this is a, a pretty safe uh, surgery after the operation's done. Um, it's it's kind of hard to have a, a major complication. Perfect. And can you explain what the physical therapy entails? I, I don't feel like we've gone too far into what happens when they go to physical therapy post right. after their surgery. That's a really good question. So as far as hip replacement goes, for most patients, I won't even start physical therapy until two weeks. And so I'll see how patients are doing at two weeks. And uh, at that point, um, if they feel like they're struggling or if they feel like they're not progressing as fast as they want, then we get them going into physical therapy. If a patient's in their 70s, a lot of the time those patients would have would, would benefit from physical therapy whether they had a hip replacement or not. And so a lot of those patients are going and they benefit from help with balance and gait and strengthening of the muscles around the hip. Um, but but for, the, for the average patient, uh, you go to the therapist in order to, number one, strengthen the muscles around the hip. Number two, normalize your gait. A lot of patients have changed their gait or altered their gait due to their arthritis. And so in order to prevent any further injury or further uh, back pain, other sided hip pain, uh, muscular hip pain on the same side, a lot of the times working on normalizing the gait is going to help. Um, but, but for the most part, it's gait, balance, and strengthening of the hip. And as far as duration, um, most patients will can see a pretty good benefit in six to eight weeks with therapy. Great. And we did have a question from Lynn. She asked, how soon after surgery can you drive? Another really good question, and the first thing is, depends on is which side we had done. Uh, obviously, you're going to drive sooner if you have a left-sided hip replacement than if you had a right. The, the, the standard answer I get is uh, two to four weeks, so typically two weeks after a left-sided hip replacement, four weeks after a right-sided hip replacement, but I, I have this conversation with everybody that asks me this question, and I say, Number one, we have to be off all of our narcotic pain medicine. We can't have you driving under the influence. And then the second thing is you have to be able to slam on the brakes. And so uh, when you can do those things, it, that, that usually is around two to four weeks, sometimes as many as six. Another question from Lynn. How often before and after surgery do we see you, Dr. Hale, versus your PA? Well, um, I do not have a PA. So you'll see me rain or shine. I see patients at two weeks, six weeks, and three months, and then also at one year, and then every three to five years after that. So if you come see me, you're seeing me. Perfect. Any last words or anything you want to address um, about this topic or anything you've talked about so far? Uh, I would just say uh, check out the the video on the YouTube channel about the live surgery, and uh, there's a lot, you can really get a better idea of of what's going on uh, in the OR with that video. And if anybody has um, any questions further, you can um, you can reach out on Facebook or you can reach out uh, to our office, and we'd love to see you at any time. And so, uh, would like to say thank you to everybody that's taken time to join the webinar. I I, I do truly appreciate it. Yes, and also that patient testimonial or patient success story is actually really great to look at because the patient went, she had two hip replacements, correct? Yeah, that, that, that individual patient had um, about six years, seven years of pain. Um, and so she had, she had very severe arthritis uh, on both sides. So the, I, I had initially planned to delay her second surgery by about six weeks but uh she was at, at her two-week appointment she was doing so well that uh we we went ahead and did her second uh surgery at, at five weeks out from surgery so she had both hips within five weeks and uh has has been very happy and uh is now walking without pain for the first time in about six or seven years Perfect. Yeah, it, it's very good. I hope you all can check it out. Um, and if you don't have anything else to say, Dr. Hill, I think that concludes for today. Okay. Th yeah, I think that's all, Terry. Thank you very much. And then uh, join us next week for the last uh, installment, which we'll talk about revision.
uh, hip arthroplasty. Yep, that's it. Next Wednesday at noon, same time, same place. Um, meet us online, go to meeting, um, and you can find our website. There's information on our website, lots of videos, and also YouTube. Check out all the videos we have, and I, we'll see you all next week. Have a great day, everybody.